increasingly, it looks as though solar can and will have a really pivotal role in the transition to a low carbon future. And interestingly, much faster, I think, than, than most people have hitherto thought possible. And this is for a couple of reasons. I mean, it's a combination of the fabulous cost down that we all know about in the industry and have all benefited from these last few years in concert with the exciting developments in storage technology, because obviously solar plus storage makes a very attractive package, not just for domestic electricity, but transport as well. But it's not just that. It, it's the compound problems that the energy incumbents, the opposition, if you like, are, are suffering. And um, these are coincidental. They're, they're happening at the same time. It's a lucky break for the solar industry. But the oil and gas industry is in big trouble. Their capital expenditures are soaring, their profitability is plunging, and on multiple frontiers of the hydrocarbon age, they are in deep trouble, and that is only going to continue in the, the years ahead. The coal industry is in structural decline. It, it is basically a dead man walking, and this too is because of, of cost issues, but also because of um, air quality issues, particularly in China. Uh, people used to love to say, you know, the Chinese are building a new coal-fired power plant every X days. Uh, but now, of course, we know that last year coal uh, production peaked in China and, and it's currently going down. Then, if you look at the nuclear industry, uh, just today we've learned that there's a huge problem with Arriva's EPR reactor. They found high carbon in the pressure vessel. This is a potentially existential problem for the nuclear industry and its expansion plans. So what have you got left? You've got the clean energy revolution. And I think uh, we're seeing every day just how much faster we can go than most people have historically thought. So it's a super exciting time for the solar industry. Our cost down uh, mega trend is the most spectacular thing in the clean energy family, but of course there are others. And I think solar is not a magic bullet. We're actually stronger when we're acting in concert with other members of the clean energy family, as you see in Germany with the double act of, of solar and wind compensating for each other's weaknesses. So I think we'll be in the front rank, but we're, we're not going to be doing it on our own. And this is another reason why um, the future is so exciting for everyone who believes in the green industrial revolution. One of the biggest threats is the, the culture in the incumbency. Now, um, I don't want to overstate this because you can see evidence of clear change in the incumbency. We have the first big energy company doing a 180 degree U-turn in its business model, and that is E.ON, the first utility to do the switch. We know that some of the big oil and gas companies are at least contemplating something equivalent to that, not to be overstated. But we also know that um, there is a hard core of people in this energy incumbency with all their vested interests who are going to go down fighting. And as one of their lobbyists said to them in, in a meeting recently in America that was leaked to the New York Times, um, you have to fight dirty if you're going to win. You can't win pretty against the clean energy industry. So we can expect dirtiness uh, from the incumbency, low tactics, hopefully within the law. Uh, and I think, you know, we've, we, we can see how, how powerful they are, how easily they can gain uh, sway with their supporters in politics on both sides of the Atlantic. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a threat that's yet to be overcome for the solar industry. And the solar industry is, frankly, pitiful in standing up to this. There's no real organiser. I don't mean to be disrespectful to the trade bodies, but there is precious little um, organised defence, much less proactive attack against this kind of thing. I think if you look at what happens at the climate negotiations, then in all the energy policy arenas around the climate negotiations, you see dozens and dozens of incumbency lobbyists. And, and they're lobbying to do uh, solar and other members of the clean energy family down. I mean, often quite openly. And the big energy companies led by GDF Suez have called for complete uh, withdrawal from renewable energy subsidies as though they don't need any themselves. 
and, uh, and this is the kind of thing that we're up against. And we see in this country, in Britain, how powerful they are. The gas industry has lobbied itself into massive bungs to local, uh, local communities if they'll accept the appalling consequences of fracking locally. They've lobbied their way to you know, massive tax breaks. They've lobbied their way to things we can't even begin to imagine in the solar industry in terms of support. So this is what I mean by um, this is our biggest threat. That I think they can, they can yet really set us back. I think they are only delaying the inevitable. But the problem with climate change is that we don't have that much time. And so um, if they delay us too long, they'll succeed in torpedoing the planet as well as their own prospects. The solar industry is still, you know, um, in certain respects immature, I, I mean in, in length of life. So, you know, when you've got a, a set of vested interests that have been going for a century on the frontiers of the hydrocarbon age, you know, they build up very powerful power structures and very powerful self-defense mechanisms, and we don't have that. Yeah. I mean, it's disappointing to me that, um, you know, given the fact that there are so many people in the clean energy industries who are made, motivated um, by a little bit more than what their um, EBITDA is at the end of the quarter, um, you know, many people actually care about the climate mission and everything else. It's disappointing to me that we haven't been able to galvanise around that set of motivations. But, you know, history isn't destiny. I think there's, there's an opportunity going forward for a, a, a much better performance than we've put in as an industry so far. The DIY approach is, is a really good one. I mean, some of these companies are big enough to deploy um, their own lobbyists in their own right, in their own name. And, you know, we work, of course, with the, with the trade bodies, but we have to recognise that a lot of the trade bodies are operating with a bit of an, an arm tied behind their backs because there are elements of the energy incumbency represented in the room there. Mm -hmm. So it's the pure play solar companies, I think, that can, it can do so much more than they are. And a little bit of coordination goes a long way, but you, you know, the bigger companies, there's no excuse for the bigger companies not having their own lobbyists out in this crucial forum and in the fora around, uh, around the climate negotiations. It isn't a fair fight at the moment. We're, we're, we're being massacred behind closed doors. It's amazing. We've, we've achieved what we have despite um, policy making, not often not, not be because of it, be because the lobbying of the energy incumbency has been so effective. What we have to do is emulate that, not the dark arts that they deploy against us, but just the straightforward deployment of information. A little information goes a long way. Most of the no negotiators, I know this, at the climate negotiations have no idea how cheap relatively, a, a modern solar station can be, be it a solar farm or, or a solar roof. Yeah. Many of them have no idea that solar even works when, it's not, when the sun isn't shining. I mean, it really is as simple as that. So an awful lot of completely above the board, um, open heart, open book uh, lobbying would go an awful long way to combat mm -hmm. some of the scaremongering and, and frankly, sometimes lying that the energy incumbency does in defense of its own interests.